getting closer. How exciting. Y'all come on in. We're glad that you're here tonight. If you want to turn to Psalm 118, that is my psalm that I will be talking about tonight. Psalm 118. This is so, it's so exciting to get to talk to people that have different colored hair. You know what I'm saying? Not blues and greens and yellows, you know, because some teenagers have that. You know, it's nice to, and a little gray. Thank you. There we go. It shows how much wisdom is here. I'm excited. Um, I'm excited about Psalm 118, and I'm, I'm going to share a little bit from that in a second. We do something at our house that is really fun. Uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, Addison texted me this morning and said that he was uh, going to be a little bit late because Macy was celebrating her half birthday. And uh, they do half birthdays. Well, um, I went to Abilene Christian University and I loved uh, Dr. Perkeen. He was just one of my favorite teachers and he taught a family relations class. And he said, I think one of the greatest things you can do is celebrate half everything, you know. And so we started at our household celebrating Thanksgiving because we always go to Abilene and my mom does the whole Thanksgiving turkey and the dressing and, and the whole shoot and match. And Karen and I then go to her folks' house, and, and her mom fixes everything. So we never actually get to fix turkey and dressing. So believe it or not, Memorial Day weekend, we invite friends over, and we have Thanksgiving. And I don't know if you saw the pictures on Facebook and stuff, but we, we do a full turkey. We do the dressing. Um, Connor, one of our, our the, the guys that comes, he's a younger guy, and he goes, man, I got an idea. We need to start recording football games so that it really feels... <laughs> like Thanksgiving. So I said, I love that idea. So, um, you know, we go out, it's funny thing is we go play golf that morning, you know, and it's, you know, 85, 90 degrees out, so it doesn't feel like Thanksgiving, but Karen does a great job fixing this, you know, great meal, and we have a great time. But I, I think it's, it's great to have Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a good thing, okay? And it's not, the title of my lesson is it's not just in November, uh, because we should be Thanksgiving people. Uh, we should be thinking about giving thanks on a constant basis. So if you're found 118, uh, we'll start looking at it, and uh, you can follow along with me. When I, was at, when I was in school, they always told us, you know, you should always tell somebody what you're going to say, then you should say it, and then you should tell them what you said. And I love how David starts this psalm off because he says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He's good. His love endures forever. And if you look at verse 29, he concludes with, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So he's going to tell us what he's going to talk about. And in the middle of this psalm, he's going to talk about what it means to truly give thanks uh, in all circumstances. And then he concludes by reminding us how important it is. So I'm going to get you to be participatory um, tonight. So what we're going to do is, in the first four verses... We're going to see his love endures forever. And then I'm just going to make sure you're awake. I'm going to give you the, the point. So you, gotta, you have to repeat that with me, okay? So we're going to practice his love endures forever. That means you have to actually say it out loud. You can't just think it. And so I have to see your lips move. Are you ready? His love endures forever, all right? So he starts out, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. In verse 2, it says, Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, You guys are good. I'm going to throw, throw in three extras. Can we do that? And I think America should say, And I think people that live in Oklahoma should say, And I think it would be great if the Broken Arrow Church of Christ said, in verse 4, let those who fear the Lord say, because it does. It's a reminder of how to be thankful. When we think about outside of just what happens right now, and we look at a bigger picture, it's important to remember that His love does endure forever. I love some of the, the things that Jesus tells us, one of which is, I will never leave you and never forsake you, ever. I'll always be there, okay? And He talks about this enduring love. Verse 5, when hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. 
The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He's my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees. They were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength. He's my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Now, verse 22 is a pretty popular verse because this is a messianic psalm. Verse 22 says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And look at verse 24. This is what I like about Psalm 118. It's one of my favorites. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Anybody recognize that verse? Okay, we're going to sing that song. Y'all ready? Because this is, what the, this is where this song, song comes from. It comes from Psalm 118. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I love that. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Verse 25, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us with bows in hand. Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Verse 28, you are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. And he concludes, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. See, some of, y'all went to, some of you went to sleep. Yeah, and Lee's over there, well, I missed my cue. Okay, let's do a little history. Psalm 118, it's got, it's got some interesting things about it. Uh, many believe that this was one of the Psalms of Ascent that the Jews would sing as they would go up to Jerusalem for the feasts. They would be singing, I don't know if it was this is the day, but they would sing this psalm as they got ready for the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, those kinds of things. There's some reason experts believe that this was the psalm that Jesus and his disciples might have sung right after the Lord's Supper as they went out to the garden. Okay, uh, I, I don't know how they justify that and know, but, but passed down through history. That's kind of cool. <clears throat> and I have a really dry mouth and I'm going to steal water. That's okay. I didn't bring enough for everybody. All right. Um, As I talked about a second ago, Psalm 118 is one of the Messianic Psalms. And people say, well, what is a Messianic Psalm? It's just a psalm that talks about the Messiah. It's a psalm that either either says something about the Messiah or prophesies something about the Messiah. And so it's it's considered one of the Messianic Psalms. Okay. Uh, It's a powerful psalm of praise. I think if I could just have read it slowly and carefully, we could have probably just quit and I could have gone home. Okay, because that had been good enough. The psalm itself speaks volumes, but it's a psalm of, of, of praise. And, and in most cases, you can almost see the Israelites dancing. Okay, and now we're not going to stand up and dance in case Tom Henderson was like snapping his finger like, man. I think he was ready for that. But, but, the, but the Jews would dance. They would sing with joy. They would be excited as they sang about the things that are in this psalm. Okay? But also lying behind the praise in this psalm, there appears to be a, a sign of grief, a little bit of hurt as well. I, was, I, was, I got to tell you, when Brandon started preaching Sunday morning and then Tim preached Sunday night, I went, what in the world? 
Because that's some of the things I was going to say in this psalm is exactly what they were saying on Sunday. Because this psalm talks about the, the sadness and the hurt and the pain and that, whoa, is there ever going to be, is that morning ever going to come? Is spring ever going to show up? Okay? And yet David is excited that the morning is coming. All right? And so we'll talk about that. He says in verse 5, In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. All right, so, so he, he knows that in his anguish things weren't so good. The nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. It surrounded me like bees. They, they died as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I, pushed them, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. And then verse 18, he says, The Lord has chastened me severely, but he's not given me over to death. So here's some, some things in this psalm where David is saying, Man, things were just not all that great. Life was not always what I wanted it to be. And if you look at David's life, you might say, well, I wonder exactly at the point in time when he wrote this. You know, was it when Saul was trying to kill him? Was it right after he lost the baby with uh, Bathsheba? Could it have been, you know, the times of exile in the wilderness, which was quite often when he was having to even live with the Philistines at one point in time, when he was having to kind of make deals with them. He had a lot of times in David's life where things just weren't as good as they were hoping them to be, okay? But I want to make this point, and I want to make it really loud and clear, and I'll, and I'll back it up with some couple, couple other things. Um, this psalm was written after David encountered these, da- these, these sad things in his life. When he went through this dangerous time, when he went through this grief, when he went through this pain, this psalm was written right after it. So David's praise came after, like Psalm 35 says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So he went through this tough time, but he realized it's going to get better because the Lord is with me. He's going to rescue me. He's my fortress. He's, he's, he's the one I give praise to. He's the one I give thanks to. Because sometimes we forget to give thanks to God when we're going through tough times, don't we? Isn't it the hardest time? They say, the experts tell me, that the least amount of psalms were written during the times of David's darkness. It's hard to write praises to God and thank God when things aren't going so great. Haven't you, haven't, haven't you felt that? It's hard to pray as much. It's hard to be thankful as much because we've bought into this lie that our circumstances control our happiness. And our circumstances are not supposed to control our happiness. Our happiness is supposed to come from the Lord. Okay? And I think David, in his maturity, as he grew up, as he became this... I mean, you have to think about the fact that he's just a teenager when he's, he's basically called to be king. I mean, he's fighting Goliath. He's doing incredible things. He's just a young guy. And so if we pay attention to his writing and we pay attention to his life, he is just growing up in front of our eyes. And these psalms kind of show this maturity as he realizes, you know what, my circumstances do not control the way I feel. I'm not going to allow these circumstances to control that. Okay? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Okay? In the midst of difficult times, there's danger. I don't know if you've seen it, but I've seen it in ministry many times. There's a danger that we might turn away from God rather than turning toward God. Have you seen folks that pray those prayers and the answer is not what they expect or they want and they turn away from God? They don't turn toward God. And and David is, this this example here in Psalm 118 is an example of him turning toward God, okay? The people who refuse the temptation to turn away from God, there's a promise, okay? Because his love endures forever. And that's the reminder to praise God in that way. David knew comfort, okay? He knew that the good shepherd was going to comfort him. And he knew that comfort. He, He felt God's comfort, and he wrote about that comfort. Scott's already done Psalm 23. Verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley... I'll fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though he goes through those hard times, even though he goes through that difficulty, he still finds that comfort from God. David was comforted and became thankful for all things from God, and he quit complaining and began to enjoy God's care and presence. Okay, So, here's the deal. I can't break down this psalm, even though as fast as I love to talk, there's no way I can break it down verse by verse and us get done tonight, okay? So I, I'm going to call the next four or five weeks, and I'll just, no, I'm just 
I don't have time to do that. So I'm going to look at it this way. I'm going I'm to try and find the greatest element that we can find in this psalm, and hopefully you can walk away from tonight and say, I get that. Okay? I'm going to take that with me tonight. And so I think that's thanksgiving. I think there's thanks throughout this psalm. I think it's, it's David looking at his life and going, I am so thankful that I have God in my life. I'm thankful for the situations that have occurred. I don't always like them, but I'm thankful because his love endures forever. Okay? So what would a lesson on Thanksgiving be like if we didn't have a Thanksgiving lesson? Illustration, right? You have to have an illustration about Thanksgiving. I just read this and it's so funny. I love it. Okay, so there's a guy. He's two days, two days before Thanksgiving. He's an older man, and, and he is excited about um, this phone call he's about to make. So he gets on the phone, and he calls his son. And his son lives, he lives, they live, back up. Uh, mother and father live in Phoenix, Arizona. So he calls his son in New York City a couple days before Thanksgiving and says, all right, this is it. I'm going to read this part because it's just funny. He, uh, he says, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing. 45 years of misery is enough. We're sick of each other, and so you call your sister who lives in Chicago, and you tell her we're getting a divorce. The son is just like, what? You know, so he calls his sister. She explodes on the phone like, no way they're getting divorced. She says, I will call him right now. And so she calls dad, and she says, there is absolutely no way you and mom are getting a divorce. You do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back. We'll both be there tomorrow. We're going to work this thing out until then. Don't you do a thing. Do you hear me? And the father goes, got it. Hangs the phone up, looks at his wife and goes, I got the kids going to be here for Thanksgiving. They're paying their own way. It's like, yes, okay? That's wisdom right there. Is that not wisdom? All right. Thanksgiving gives us a chance to be together as a family, regardless of how you get them there, right? But Thanksgiving is a time when our families come together and we, and we sit around and, and mostly, for the most part, we sit around and we spend time together, quality time. We eat meals together and we talk about the blessings and, and you, your family comes together and, and you dream a little bit about what those grandkids are going to do or those children are going to do and you dream and you talk and, and it's just a great time. And I don't know why we just do it once a year. Why, why don't we get together more? Why don't we make time to be thankful? Okay. And so that's what I want us to talk about a little bit more tonight. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. We got to remind ourselves of that. God wants nothing more than for us to be people of thanksgiving and gratitude. Okay? So, what lesson would Mike Basket ever preach without three points? So, here are the three points. Okay? Number one, how do you, how do you be, get, become more grateful? Being more grateful can increase your personal happiness. Okay? By being more grateful, by being, more want, by being someone who gives more thanks, it's going to increase your personal happiness happiness okay like I said a little while ago most of us think that our happiness is determined by our circumstances if I ask you right now how happy you are you might say well I'm, I'm a two because things just aren't going that great or I'm an eight because things are going great okay ask a youth minister at the end of summer how's you know how happy are you <laughs> summer's over no it's not true it's not true I love summer we're just busy during summer. But we can't, allow, we can't allow our circumstances to determine our level of happiness. And, I, and of course, I'm not saying, you know, oh, I just found out that somebody that's close to me has cancer. I just found out somebody close to me has passed away. Somebody's, you know, I'm not saying that negative news. We just go, joy to the Lord. No. But deep inside of us, where we really are, especially in our relationships, we've got to realize, man, there's a big picture. Because we need to give thanks to the Lord. Because his Love endures forever, okay? That's the big picture. Regardless of what happens here, I've got a reason to wake up each day and be happy, okay? Happiness is determined by our attitude. It really is. Happiness is determined by our attitude. It's, it's, it's a Zig Ziglarism. Anybody know who Zig Ziglar is? That's one of my heroes. I love Zig Ziglar. He would call it stinking thinking, okay? When you don't think positively and you don't think about the good and you only think about the bad, that's negative thinking. That's stinking thinking. Okay? I think it's interesting that there's, there's a system in our, in our bodies. Behavioral scientists tell us the fortress, I shared this with the fortress, which is, is our, our mentoring program, but I really love it. It's called a reticular activation system. Okay? Everyone has one. 
Behavioral scientists tell us it is we think and we act upon and we see what we've been programmed to see. Okay, reticular activation system. I used to have these little fun little games I did with teenagers back when I did leadership training, and they're all over the internet now. They used to be really fun and cool, and nobody ever saw them before. Now they're all over everywhere. But they were they were pictures, and you look at them, you're like, do you see the one person? And they're like, yeah, I can see the one face. You know, look deeper, look clearer. You know, and you're like, and then like, I can't see. And you know, there's two faces, and you're like, oh, and then you see the two faces. Okay. Reticular activation is something like this. When I was looking to buy a Nissan Altima, and I was thinking of what car I really wanted to buy, I thought, I'm going to buy a Nissan Altima. I wonder how many Nissan Altimas there are. And I started looking at Nissan Altimas, and all of a sudden, they're everywhere, because I'm looking for Nissan Altimas. I remember when we first moved here, this is what I was telling um, the guys at the Fortress, we didn't realize, that, you know, Scott's when it told me that license plates were a lot the same. You know, we just thought it was really cool, because we saw Woo, W-E-W, Hunter, one morning, we're going to school, and he goes, Dad, woo! You know, and I went, what? And he goes, woo! Are you that happy to go to school? No, Dad, look, the license plate in front is woo! And so I'm like, oh, funny. Well, I, I, we're driving a little bit further. We see another woo. And we're like, well, that's two woos in the same day. Woo, woo, you know? So if we see three, it's woo, 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 you know? And so we're getting happier as we go along. We see woo. And then all of a sudden, I leave for lunch, and I see another woo. You know? and so we made a notebook. And, and had zero, zero, zero to 999, and we started marking all the woos. Oh, there's woo 162, there's woo 189, there's woo 784. We got like 600 woos, you know, over the course of the next two years. But you know what? We started paying attention to license plates because our reticular activation system said, I'm going to start paying attention to license How many of you guys look at license plates? Okay, so see there? Now you're going to start going, where's a woo? We, we found a GPS, and then we found a PHO, I think, a foo, you know? So we, we just started pay atten pay, paying attention to them. But there's Nissan Altimas everywhere. Somebody else drives a gray Nissan Altima, just like I do. Who has it? Are you here? Is it yours? I didn't know that was yours. Okay, it drives me nuts. You know that, right? Because I'll be like, I did not park here. It's identical to mine, so it's, it's just funny. But we start, we start noticing, okay, we start noticing things that we have been programmed to see. That is a reticular activation system. Paul saw thanksgiving. He saw thanks in all things. I know that because in, in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Where do you write that from? Prison. It's kind of hard to rejoice when you're in prison. But he, you know what? He didn't let his circumstances determine his happiness. Okay? He also continues in that same thought when he says, hey, think on these things. Whatever is admirable, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is good. Think this way. See this. See, if we start looking at the glasses half empty all the time, we're going to realize, oh, you know, life is not so good, but when we see that glass half full, we go, wow. There's another whole, have you ever, you ever seen the, the whole glass half empty, half full, and all that stuff? The engineer would think this way, and a, never mind, probably haven't seen it. I, should have, I just thought of it, or I would have put it in my illustration, but I forgot to do that. So, um, Our perspective is important. Okay? The way we see things is extremely important, and, and the way we look at our life is extremely important. When we start looking... Um, at our Christianity as a burden or we start seeing things in a negative way, we're, we're activating to look at all the negatives. You know, we can, we can come somewhere and, and all of a sudden we're looking for the bad instead of the good. Uh, when, we, when we start doing that, that's not a good thing, okay? I'll give, you a, I'll give you an illustration on perspective. There's a young college student and she wrote her mom from college and she hadn't written her in a while, and she wrote these words. Dear Mom, I'm so sorry I haven't written sooner, but I broke my arm. Unfortunately, I broke my left leg, too. It was awful. We had a fire in our dormitory, and when I couldn't get to the stairs, I jumped from the second floor of my dormitory. That's how I broke my leg and my arm. I was fortunate and very lucky and, and feel blessed because a young servant, service station attendant named Paul came to my rescue. She saw, he saw the blaze, called the fire department. They were there in minutes, but before they got there, Paul took total care of me. He nursed me back until they could get there, take me to the hospital. I got to the hospital, and Paul came and saw me before work and after work. It's just the greatest thing ever. 
He's so sweet. And because it was taking so long to get our dormitory livable again, he invited me to move in with him. I think I'm in love. Also, I hate to tell you this, but I'm now pregnant. But don't worry, Paul and I plan to get married just as soon as he gets a divorce. Okay? And figure out what to do with the kids. I hope things are fine at home, and I'm doing fine, really, Mom. Don't worry, I promise to write more when I get the chance. Signed, your loving daughter, Susie. Okay? P.S. Mom, none of the above is true, but I did flunk chemistry and got a C in sociology. And I just wanted you to receive this news in its proper perspective. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, oh, is that all? I just, you know, you just got a C and you just flunked. You know, does that not change? All of a sudden you go, oh, that's no big deal. Okay. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty wise from a college student. Okay. Sometimes our perspective changes. Sometimes we see things from a totally different way, and it will change the way we respond to that situation. So I'm trying to help us tonight think the way David thought, think the way Paul thought, and to, to re be reminded of giving thanks to the Lord okay, at all times and be reminded that his love endures forever. Okay? So happiness is really determined by our perspective in life, not by our circumstances. It's the way we see what we see that's important. So being a grateful person can increase your personal happiness. And number two, being a grateful person can improve your witness for Christ. I think this is extremely important. I really do. I love what Alan Perkins wrote. He said, a thankful spirit is one of the key distinguishing marks of a Christian. It sets us apart from the world. It makes us different to be thankful. When we have a noticeable joy, a thankful heart, a, 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 a mind that sees only the good, people notice. What's sad is how many negative, upset, and complaining Christians there are in the world. I mean, I know there's none of those, no, none of those in here. I'm just talking about those out there, okay? That we have folks that, that complain a lot. They, they, they see negative things. They're sour, mean-spirited, ungrateful. They act like they've been baptized in vinegar, you know? They just, and I've been around folks like that, and you're like, you know, and then they tell you you're a Christian. You go, really? You know, it's like, where's your joy? Where's your excitement? There's, there's, there's no wonder people are turned off by Christianity and some Christians whenever we don't have this joy. We should be the happiest and most thankful people in the world. God has saved us through his grace. What a great gift. It's something that we should share. So when we're thankful and joyful and upbeat, we attract the lost, uh, the lost with our spirit of gratitude. They need to see light. The world's depressing enough, right? We should be the ones that are that's shining our lights at all times. 1 Peter 2.12 reads, Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. So Peter was saying the same thing. He says, hey, you know, your good deeds, your attitude, the way you live your life, it's, it's great for the pagans, okay? They need to see that so that they can glorify God. So being a grateful person increases your personal happiness improves your witness for Christ, and number three, it enhances your relationships, okay? It will always enhance your relationships. I did a wedding last weekend, and I will do a wedding this weekend. And in my wedding, my charge to my young couple, I always include some important advice that I've always gotten from those of you that have different colored hair, or no hair, you know, in some cases, okay? And that is... Never take your mate for granted. That's what I've been told. When I ask older folks and I say, you know, if there's some good advice you can give to this young married couple, you know, they, they, they have some funny ones, you know, don't hang your underwear on the doorknob, you know, things like that. You know, funny stuff, you know, don't leave the lid off of the toothpaste and, and silly little things. But the, the, the reality is, in most cases, they say, just don't take them for granted. Be thankful for them every single day. Now, I don't know if we practice that all the time, but that's something that I think is very, very important. Somebody described the first year in marriage this way. The husband sees the wife has a cold, very first year of marriage, and says, you don't look good. I'm going to get you to the hospital. In fact, I've already called the doctor. I've arranged it. I know the food is bad there, and we're going to have meals catered to you. Okay? Second year of marriage, he says, you don't look so good. I called the doctor. Go lay down. I'll take care of the kids. The doctor will be here in a little bit. Okay? Third year of marriage. You know you're not looking so hot. When you're done feeding the kids and cleaning up the kitchen, you ought to go lay down. Fourth year of marriage, would you quit walking around here barking like a seal? You're going to make me sick. Okay? Have you not seen 
that progression in relationships. The longer you know somebody, the less thankful that you are for them at times. We take them for granted. And one of the, the hardest places for that is in a marriage relationship. So husbands, imagine how much better your relationship with your wife would be, okay, if you went home and, and brought flowers and, and brought chocolate and brought that beautiful card and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for all the things that you ever do every day. Okay, when's the last time you've done that? So wives, you should be getting that happening here pretty quick there, all right? Niquette, I'm looking right at you, buddy. Yeah, okay, yeah. He's giving me the, he's giving me the, okay? And, and wives, how much more appreciative, how much better is your relationship with your husband going to be when you thank him for all of his hard work, for all the things that he does around the house, and hopefully that's not a lie when you say he does great things around the house, but when you do all this, when we start thanking each other, when we start th- seeing the things that take place and are more thankful, Kids, there's some teenagers in here. How much better would your relationship with your parents be if you asked or told your parents, thank you for all that you do for me. Thank you for buying my food and buying my clothes and taking care of me. Uh, Thank you. When's the last time you've thanked your parents for what they've done for you um, each and every day? You know, those relationships are really important. And how about in the church? How about in the church? How much better would our church relationships be if we expressed our thanks to each other instead of nitpicked at each other and found each other's faults out? I think we do that. I think we do that in the church as well. Sometimes we forget to thank people for what they do. There's so many jobs that go on. I, I think it was fun with the teenagers. When we started our 444 class, we sat in there. Patrick, you were there, weren't you? And we just started talking about, you know, hey, are y'all enjoying, are you enjoying this morning? Yes, you know. Wow, it's nice to sit in air conditioning. Yeah, how did that air conditioner get here? What do you mean? How's the air conditioning in the room? Uh, the machine's on? The air conditioner's on? Yeah, but who turned it on? Oh, yeah, somebody had to turn that on. Oh, yeah. Well, how'd you get in the door? Oh, somebody had to unlock the door. Oh, isn't, isn't it nice and clean in here? Why, somebody clean this up. When we, go to, when we go to services, you know, communion's already set and ready. Who did that? Who put all the communion trays in place? You're sitting in chairs tonight. How'd the chairs get here? This afternoon they were playing dodgeball. You know, some, some high school guys set chairs up. You know, there's just so many things. If you st- st- stop for a second, and, and we did, we filled the chalkboard up. I mean, literally from left to right, top to bottom, with all of the things that have to be done in the church to make the church work. And some people are just not ever thanked. We just forget to say thank you. Thank you, Robert, for running the sound and making the sound work. You know, I walk in here sometimes and I just assume it's going to work, you know, because he's up there doing his job. Okay, so, so we need to be a thankful people. I think everything would be much better. I love that the Apostle Paul began all of his letters, or most of his letters like this. To the church in Rome, he wrote, First, I thank my God for all of you. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. To the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 4, I always thank God for you. To the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 1, 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. To the church in Philippi, Philippians 1, 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. Colossians 1.3, the church at Colossae, I always thank God when I pray for you. Isn't that cool that Paul would remember to be thankful on a constant basis? I think that he learned that God's love endures forever as he sat in those prison cells, as he sat and had to take so much from people helping him. Because back in that day, they didn't have TVs and they didn't have all the things that they have now. People had to come to bring him food and people had to bring him the things that he needed to write those letters so Paul made sure he let people in the churches know he was thankful for them, and we need to do the same. Because God loves a thankful heart. I know that because Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 says, Let us please God by serving him with thankful hearts. Let me read that to you again. Let us please God by serving him with thankful hearts. Okay? It's pleasing to God to be thankful. Okay? It only makes sense that we should celebrate thanksgiving every single day. And let's not forget to even thank God. We've talked about our wives and husbands and kids and maybe grandparents and and thanking people. But how about like thanking God every day for all that we have? Our relationship with him will get better as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So it's God's will that we thank him and we thank everyone. To be thankful is God's will. It's not just a good practice. It's not just something that we ought to do. It's God's will for us that we should thank him on a constant basis. So, okay, so you agree. Maybe maybe I got you converted and you think, man, I'm going to be a more thankful person. What are some things that we can do to be more thankful, to to develop thanksgiving in our lives? First, I think it's important that we recognize that everything we have is from God. Okay, that would be a good starting place. Everything we have is from God. 
Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We need to be thankful for the loan that God has given us. God's given us in this country incredible things. At the very end, I'm going to quote you some statistics, and I think that, that'll, that'll keep that in perspective. So I'll save that to the end. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, What do you have that you did not receive from God? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Everything comes from God. The story is told of a poor man who, who received some bread, and so he went to the baker, and he told the baker, uh, I, I thank you for the bread. And the baker said, don't thank me, thank the miller. Okay, Thank the miller who made the flour. So he went to the miller, and he thanked the miller, and the miller said, hey, don't thank me, thank the farmer who planted the wheat. So he goes to the farmer, and he thanks the farmer, and the farmer says, don't thank me, thank God, because God gave the sunshine and the rain and the fertility of the soil so that you had bread to eat. Ultimately, it all comes down back to God. You know, it, it's, it's all thanking God for what he has given us each and every day. We ultimately receive all things from him, and we, we owe him the thanks. So give thanks to the Lord, for he's good. His love endures forever. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting sand. Everything, every good gift, perfect gift is from God. So realize everything we have is from God. And number two, um, if we want to be thankful, we need to avoid complaining. Okay? Complaining is the arch enemy of being thanks or, or giving thanks. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever fasted? Would not be a class without a challenge. Okay? We've all fasted. Have you fasted from food? If you fasted from food, raise your hand. How many of you have fasted from stuff? Have you ever said, okay, we're not going to watch TV? We did, a, we did a thing called fasting from the fast lane one time, and we fasted from all media for an entire week at our congregation. No TV, no radio, no magazines, no Facebook. No. Some people, I was like, ah! <laughs> they were just like, we can't do it. You know, because it was hard. I mean, they had to get it. You know, we said, okay, exceptions to the rules are at work. If you have to use your computer. But it was a neat week. We had an activity every single night, a family night. We, you know, we had a family night, movie night one night, and, which was media, but, you know, anyway. But we did it all together, and we, but we fasted from stuff. So I'm going to ask you to t take a challenge for the rest of the summer. Since many of the psalms are about thanks and thanksgiving, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to have no complaints for the entire summer. I heard somebody here go, what? <laughs> okay. No complaining whatsoever. For the entire summer, you're like, wow, I don't know if I can do that. You can, but it's, again, you got to practice in your head, okay? Dr. Dale Robbins writes, I used to think people complained because they had a lot of problems. But I've come to realize they have problems because they complain. Complaining doesn't change anything, and it doesn't make any situations better. It amplifies frustration, spreads discontent and discord, and can invoke an invitation for the devil to cause havoc in our lives. That's pretty strong. Okay? Pretty strong. But Psalm 77 3 says, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. David's like, ah, you know, complaining did not do me any good. I think comparison, I know I did this lesson when we did the, 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 the series of lessons when we walked around, and I did this comparison of of Cokes. I don't know if you remember that little illustration or not. Many of you were in there, some of you may not have been. But what, what we did is we gave a little bitty Coke and a little candy bar to one person, and then I gave a bigger Coke and a bunch more candy bars to the next person, and then I gave a really big Coke and a lot of candy bars to the next person, and the third person's like, well, wait a minute, you know? And they compared and said, well, I, I only got, you know, I only got a little bit. How come they got more? And then I said, hey, look at everybody in the audience. How much did they get? See, I, I think when we compare wrongly, I think we compare to those who have less than us, we'll be more thankful, okay? Because comparison is the enemy of contentedness. You know, I'm very content with what I have until I see somebody that has something better than me. Then I'm not so content anymore. You know, I think I told you we love to do, we love to watch all the F, uh, what is it? Um, sorry, home improvement shows, FY, not FYI, what is that show? DIY. Where did I get F from? I don't know. Okay, DIY. We used to, we used to love to watch those. I, I, I don't watch them anymore because I really like my kitchen until I watch that show. I'm like, oh, granite countertops? You know? And then I look at, you know, I, I, we, go to, we go to the store every once in a while and we'll walk through a section and I'm like, wow, that is a really nice couch. That looks way better than our couch. I thought our couch was great until I saw that couch. Okay? So we start comparing, and that's the enemy of being content, because if we have nothing to compare to, we'll be absolutely fine with what we have. 
Okay? But if we are going to compare, we need to compare with those that have less than us. Complaining is the arch enemy of thanksgiving. Okay? How hard is it, how hard is it um, to complain when you're being so thankful? You know, when I'm just filled with thanks, it's hard to complain. Okay, because they're, they're kind of opposites. They can't coexist in the same heart. So I challenge you for the next couple of months, just try it. And it's, and it's a lot harder. I've been complaining a lot lately myself. And, I, and I've been working on this lesson. And I've been thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, you've got to pay attention to what you're teaching and what you're talking about. It's hard not to complain. Okay? Philippians 2.15, I've got to throw a verse in there. Oh, I, I, did, I, I did see this little phrase. It says, when you feel tempted to complain, instead of filing your complaint, file a praise. Okay? File a praise. It'll change your life. That's what this guy said. Philippians 2.15 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Jesus says, hey, be the light of the world. You know, stars shine brightly. When, when stars are shining brightly, people pay attention to those things. And when they see that you're not a complainer, that you're a thinker, then uh, things, will, things will change. Okay? Lastly, spirit of thanksgiving. How to develop a spirit of thanksgiving is develop a daily discipline of giving thanks. A daily discipline of giving thanks. Okay, in order to be thankful people, we need to start to give thanks on a daily basis. Not just once a year on Thanksgiving. Not even during half Thanksgivings, because, you know, we're so much more thankful than you because we celebrate Thanksgiving twice a year. So compare yourself to us, okay? Absolutely kidding. All right? We just need to be more thankful. We need to celebrate more often. We need to find ways to be more thankful. Create a thanks journal. Or a new file on your computer where we list the things that God has done for us. Call it a praise file. Okay? Thanksgiving must become a daily habit. We do, we do warm fuzzies at camp. When I'm having a bad day, you know what I do? I pull out my warm fuzzy file. And I read through those warm fuzzies because I need some affirmation. I need some thanks. You know, it just makes my day. And so I have it. It's on my if you If you come into my office, it's on my desk on the right side about third back. And it says warm fuzzies. And I pull it out and I read them. And I love my warm fuzzy file because it's a, it's a reminder that people are thankful of me when there's times when I don't think they are. Okay? We all need that. Thanks. And I'm not, you know, I don't want 15, 20. Yeah, you can send me letters if you want to. That'd be cool. I'll put them in my, I'll put them in my, I do. I put any, any nice things I put in my warm fuzzy file. Um, we need to create journals like that and praise files. So when you're having a bad day, pull, you know, get on the computer and pull out your praise file or your thank file and be like, whoo, this is great stuff. I love Ephesians 5.19. We often say this is the reason we shouldn't have musical instruments, but there's so much more to that verse than that. It says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. That's where the joy comes. That's where the joy comes. You know, it's, 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 not, it's a text that's reminding us to be thankful, to sing, to have this song. You know, you've seen those movies like, oh, I've got this song in me, I just got to let it out. You know, that's what it is. It's this joy and this praise. Um, Remember this song, When Upon Life's Billows, You Are Tempest Tossed, When You Are Discouraged, Thinking All Is Lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. What a great verse. What a great, what a great song. I would sing that for you, but I would probably butcher it. Thanksgiving is a daily discipline. And I told you I would conclude with this, and so this is my conclusion. I read recently that if you own one Bible, you are abundantly blessed because a third of the people in the world do not have access to a Bible. If you awoke this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than one million people who will not survive the week. Okay? If you have never experienced the danger of war, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are more fortunate than 500 million people on earth. If you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, $20 in your pocket, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the entire world. Okay? God forgive us when we whine. So, I almost made it all the way through. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Thank you for being here tonight. Do we have anything else we're supposed to do?